All right, we're going to get started with our ACCM Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month 2024 Arts Advocacy Training. We have our great team has put together uh, these slides, and we have a lot that we're going to go over today and prepare you all for ACCM 2024 and our advocacy, uh, not only advocacy day, but advocacy training throughout the entire month. Um, we can go to our next slide. And again, feel free to put your information in the chat. All right, this is just our agenda here. We have our welcome, of course. We're going to talk about what's going on for Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month for this year. And we have, then we're going to go on to our advocacy opportunities. We're going to be talking about our legislature vis visits, along with uh, getting information around our advocacy opportunities with more, with um, various information and the importance of advocacy. Then we're going to go into our context and strategies for 2024 to 2025, speaking of budget, context, and as well as budget and legislature priorities. And then we're gonna finish up with some advocacy tips and we will be having a Q&A throughout this session. So if you have any questions, um, you can put it in the chat or you can ask out when we do our Q&A. Next slide, please. All right, many of you may already know, but for anyone that does not know, we have two partnering or sister organizations. We are your statewide arts advocacy um, partner and network. And we have CA Arts Advocates, which is our 501c4, where we do our comprehensive lobbying. Um, and here you see a bold in, in bold, where it says influence equitable and just systems for change, systems change through public policy and public investment. And then we have our CA for the Arts, where we champion arts and culture as essential to a vibrant California. CA for the Arts is our 501c3 organization where we really focus on statewide programming, um, services, and advocacy networks. And you also see our contact information. If anyone needs to contact us specifically around advocacy, um, or if you have questions for CA for the Arts, you can always contact our CEO who is on this call, Julie Baker, as well as our Director of Field Engagement, Tracy Hudak, who's also on this call, and she and both will be speaking a little bit later. So thank you. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. All right, I love this gift here. It's Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month, and our theme for this month is Artwork is Real Work. We have our summit coming up, which we will share more information about, uh, but our focus will be Artwork is Real Work, and again, these slides will be shared out for tools that you can also share on your social media. And this is a great one to share. All right, you can go to the next slide. So as we talked about various things that are happening in April, which we are really excited about, and this does not include some of our other events, but these are two of our events that we've been working around the clock to make sure are really meaningful, really impactful for our community, for the whole of the arts ecosystem throughout California. We have our California Arts and Culture Summit, which we will talk about a little bit later in some of our slides, talking about some of the panels and things that we can expect at the summit. I hope that you all are registered. If you're not, we still do have tickets available if you're interested in joining us at the Sophia in Sacramento on April 16th. It's going to be a full day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., and then we're going to have a small reception after uh, where we can hang out, network, and mix and mangle and get to know each other. Along with that, we have our rally coming up, at, or excuse me, our Arts Advocacy Day, and the rally is at 9 a.m. the next morning. It's going to be at Capitol Park in Sacramento. Our Arts Advocacy Day is where we go and speak with policymakers, and we're going to share, we'll share more about that uh, a little bit later in our discussion today, and that's going to be on April 17th in a row that we're going to be making impactful change in the arts and uh, convening. And you can go to the next slide. Also, um, in the chat, you're going to see links and more information. Thank you to our entire team for sharing um, the information that you'll see in the chat just to follow along. Here is a little reel that we want to share with you, just a little recap from last year and some excitement as we go into this upcoming summit. Thank you. 
California for the Arts presents the second annual California Arts and Culture Summit, taking place on April 16th, 2024. This year, our theme is Artwork is Real Work. We are diving deep into exploring how the arts integrated across various sectors and industries can be a catalyst for creative solutions. The California Arts and Culture Summit is proudly hosted by California for the Arts, your statewide arts advocacy organization. Don't miss out on this opportunity to be a part of a movement shaping the future of California through the lens of creativity and innovation. Tickets are still available. Secure yours today and invest in your professional growth. Join us for engaging panels, hands-on workshops, networking opportunities, and more. This is one of the few summits where the whole of the arts and culture ecosystem gather, from artists and culture bearers to administrators, public funders, researchers, and public policy analysts across various creative fields. Everyone convenes under one roof on one day. Together, we'll share ideas and strategies to drive systemic change that prioritizes arts, culture, and creativity for equity and justice. This Arts and Culture Summit is where creativity meets. So let's unite to harness the transformative power of the arts, envisioning a brighter tomorrow for California. Thank you. Thank you for showing that video. And if you're interested in sharing that video out, uh, we have this available. Well, it's on our Instagram page and our, all of our social media. So you can feel free to share that. Uh, as it's a real on Instagram. If you go to at CA for the arts and you'll see that there, please feel free to share that out. Also, uh, I believe in the chat, there were some uh, some links shared with our toolkits. And really quickly, I'm just going to go through our summit panels and workshop topics. In the real, you see there's one screen that or one image that breaks down some of the names and the people that will be leading these panel and panel discussions and workshops. Uh, but I just want to give a, a, a little bit more background with this. Um, our we we are we have arts and health, which we're going to be focusing on arts on prescription. It's going to be led by Deborah Cullinan, who is uh, Stan at Stanford, the VP for arts at Stanford, along with Tasha Golden, who is at the forefront of looking at arts and health, uh, who works at, she heads to the Director of Research at the International Arts and Mind Lab at Johns Hopkins, as well as Chris Appleton, who runs Art Pharmacy. And I won't name all of the names for all of the panels, but I just wanna give some highlights. We're gonna be talking about economic justice for one of the panels and community power building. Our very own board member, Miss T, is going to be leading that as our moderator. Uh, Rashawn Davis, who runs, is the Executive Director of Culture and Unseen Heroes, who works with us every year with our summit will be a part of that panel discussion. And just moving forward with some of our panels, we have creative conditionings, conditions, we're talking about employment in the creative economy, arts and youth, we'll be talking about, talking with uh, Create California. We'll also have uh, Josiah Bruni, who's our, one of our board members for Music Changes Lives. Artists and, and arts and housing and workspace, really important conversation as we have a, a working group that our workspace group that is working together to create equitable housing and workspaces. And then we have artists on artists work where we'll be talking about, we know that our theme is art, artwork is real work. So we'll be diving into that a little bit more. And then our workshops, we have our uh, discussion around Prop 28 with Create California, uh, Arts on Prescription, Tasha Golden will be doing her first workshop on this discussion, which is going to be an interactive workshop, thinking about how do we then apply the things that we're learning at the work at this uh, summit, along with the power mm. of posters and oh civic God, engagement, God. and our very own Tracy, oh along with Jackie Melendez, will be doing a case making for collaboration, and we'll be finishing it off with uh, our policy wins and updates and visions for the future, and there will be space where at the summit where people can come up to the mic and speak at an open mic uh, moment where we're getting feedback after our panel discussions and workshops. So just want to share a little bit about the summit and we can go to our next slide, please. All right. And, and as I said in the chat, there were uh, some of the toolkits, I believe, were shared already. But this information is for everyone. It's access for everyone to be able to share out, to share on your platforms, at your um, workspaces within your community. And these are templates that are toolkits for op-eds, for ACCM press relief, 
uh, release. If you see our backgrounds, thank you to our comms team we created these great backgrounds. They're accessible for each of you to use if you'd like to use them for, for your Zoom meetings throughout the month of April. And then we have our social media toolkit. We're going to talk a little bit more about our proclamation guide, but we have proclamations that, or excuse me, I'm, sorry, I have correction. We're not going to go into the proclamations, but there's also a proclamation toolkit that you can utilize if you would like to get a proclamation within your city or your community. And you can go to the next slide, please. All right. And this is a sample of our social media posts. As we saw at the beginning, that gift that said artwork is real work. You can see that here. We have our social media toolkit where you can utilize that that gift along with other resources to share on your social media platforms as we talk about things like arts and health, our workforce, economic justice, health and climate change, and a variety of other topics and our hashtags throughout the month, which we uh, would love for you all to utilize so that we can then share some of the posting that you all are doing. Hashtag artwork is real work. Hashtag invest California or CA arts. CA Arts Advocacy, and you can see the rest below. So these are resources that we want you all to utilize and uh, and really make some some noise throughout our, our communities here in California to remember that the arts are important and artwork truly is real work. And I believe you can go to the next slide. Thank you. All right. So I am going to pass the mic over to our team to continue continue this conversation, I believe it's Tracy next, to share more about Advocacy Day and, or excuse me, Advocacy Month in mm -hmm. April. Thanks, Nafesha. Hi, everyone. Um, Tracy Hudak, Director of Field Engagement. I'm just excited to share that April is also Arts Advocacy Month because it's a key month for budget uh, negotiations and budget advocacy. Um, ACCM is um, really a, lines up strategically with the with the legislature and, and, and budget development for the state. So we're really excited that you all participate in it. Um, and uh, next slide, I want to talk a little bit about our advocacy opportunities Welcome. that are offered and that, um, reminding folks to mute. Sorry, we made, I'm going to, I got you. Okay, cool. Um, we've got two ways of supporting legislator visits uh, this year. One is, of course, Advocacy Day at the Capitol, with which Nefesha mentioned. And then we also have a DIY legislator meeting toolkit. And... Um, in, uh, next slide, please. And the goals of legislator meetings in this window of time are to empower and activate folks, to, to provide tools and resources for people to build relationships with their representatives. And the, the tools that we provide and resources are applicable to local or state level advocacy. And um, and also, this is a really prime opportunity to educate leg legislators on the issues that are impacting our field, on the on the the value we bring to our community, our economy, etc. These these conversations are great in terms of uh, socializing our issues and 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 building relationships with legislators that are informed and and uh, care about what's happening in their district. And of course, it's really important to us to act the state to make sure that legislators all over the state and urban and rural areas are hearing from their constituents and their arts leaders in their community, um, especially when we look at kind of the composition of state level budget committees, et cetera. Those are populated by by representatives all over the state. And so we really want um, we we really want uh, uh, all legislators to, to learn um, to learn about our field and um, what budget and legislation we need. Next slide. Uh, just a quick um, uh, little bit of information about Advocacy Day. It involves a rally. Uh, arts champion legislators often speak at it, as well as leaders in our field, artists and cultural organization directors and um, uh, union leaders, etc. And then we parade. We generally have a, a, a creative um, visual and sonic parade. And then we break up into groups and and sit in and and. Sit 
sit down with legislators and their staff and, and have these meetings. And California for the Arts and California Arts Advocates, we handle all of the scheduling. We compile all the information about legislation and budget budget items and provide a talking points doc that you, is kind of like a menu in terms of things that you might want to say that are meaningful to you with um, tools and resources for also bringing your personal insights into the conversation and trainings. Next slide. And for the DIY toolkit, uh, we offer uh, the tools you need to take to do the scheduling, the contact information at legislator offices, cut and paste schedule a meeting request email copy um really plug and play get get yourself set up with meetings and then um for both toolkits uh for both we offer the guide to effective to successful advocacy which is just kind of a a, a great primer and resource around around conducting effective meetings and building meaningful and positive relationships and of course uh, additional training resources Next slide, please. And these um, DIY meetings, you can schedule them in person in district or you can do them on Zoom at your convenience. And, uh, and this is just a snapshot of page one from the toolkit and kind of break down resources for each step of setting up and conducting, conducting and following up on your meetings. Next slide. And in terms of um, ongoing support uh, for support for participating in either Advocacy Day or setting up your own meetings, we have the training from today. And again, this will be recorded and shared out. And then we are also offering drop-in office hours, Fridays at lunchtime. If you've got any questions um, about uh, just even where to begin or deeper dive into strategy, it's kind of a peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunity to come together and and. Um, and uh, learn from each other as well as get questions answered. And then at the summit, we'll be offering um, a, a lunch during lunch, a breakout, a, 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 a lunch room specifically devoted to talking about Advocacy Day with um, with Abe Flores, with myself, Abe Flores uh, at with Create California and Ricky Abales from Arts for LA. And we'll just kind of get ourselves ready and excited and answer any questions there on the day, the day before Advocacy Day. Next slide. Great. And um, yeah, and do anybody have any questions about uh, all things ACCM or the legislator visits? If you do raise hands since we're kind of in a share screen situation. And or also- just, Or just shout out. Because yeah, we're shout out. in the share screen situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, any questions? I just um, wanted to flag for you all, we're still trying to expand our scholarship pool to to the summit. And um, to that to that effect, we've created an artist and arts workers scholarship fund form. If folks want to um, maybe have someone that might support their professional development if, if their work won't, isn't able to um, cover the cost of the summit, we're, uh, or you know someone who might want to help others get to the summit and expand our scholarship pool. We were only able to offer scholarships so far to less than half of the folks that wanted to come. So we're really working to try to, to um, raise more money for the summit to make sure folks can come. And great, um, Amy and then Jennifer. Uh, thanks so much, Tracy. And great work on all this, everybody. Um, I just wanted to find out if you've chose legislator to get folks together. I'm sorry, Amy, you were breaking up a little bit. Can you ask that oh, again? Sorry. Um, I was just wondering if you had chosen all the leaders for legislation day, legislator day, and uh, where I find that information. Oh, great, great. I'm going to ask Martha Denson and Jenica Bisbee to raise use the raise hand feature so I can introduce the, the, the rest of the team who's helping organize these. So we're still recruiting captains, folks, and captains essentially are folks that help lead and coordinate the meeting, um, uh, connect with the group ahead of time and, and cover talking points and who can speak most clearly and passionately to what. So we're still organizing that and, and recruiting. And um, if you're interested, Amy, I'll make sure we follow up after. And if you could put your email in the chat and I'll have Martha, Martha's there. And then Jenica is our field engagement coordinator and she's helping with scheduling as well. So great question. And uh, thanks for that. 
and Jennifer. Hi, Tracy. Um, you had asked about questions and the question I still have is I went in and I signed up for a number of slots in Sign Up Genius, but I'm not clear how I prioritize those. Like if there's somebody who's going to be terming out, but they've been really good in my field, my sector, I want to, I want to make sure that I, I communicate kind of what my priorities are, but I didn't see a mechanism to do that in Sign Up Genius. Okay, let's, what we'll do is we'll look at where you signed up. There's a two-step yeah, process, everybody. You register for Advocacy Day. Uh and then, um, and then you select your meetings. And and some folks have said, I can show up for this meeting, this this meeting, this meeting, and then we need to help them prioritize, like Jennifer's um, indicating here. So we'll look at what you've signed up for and double check that against who's on what committees, and um, especially those that govern um, uh, museum funding, which I know that's that's. And then and we can have a little bit of back and forth. We can do it via email, or we can jump on the office hours on Friday and just do a, a better analysis of that for you. Thank you. Great, great question. Thank you. Anybody else? And anybody with captain questions can please email Martha. Her chat, her um, email is in the chat. Okay, great. And then I'm going to pass the mic to Julie so we can take a deep dive into policy and strategy. Awesome. Well, such great work. I just want to commend the team. They are incredible. And thank you for incredible work that you've done to get us this far in April already. It's not even April 1st. And all this work is just, anyway, they're an amazing group of humans. So I just want to shout out to every one of them who are on the CA for the Arts team and CA Arts Advocates and all the hard work that they put into this. So next slide. So yeah, so context and strategy, what's happening in uh, 2024 to 2025 legislative session? Let's go to the next slide. That is our beautiful capital that is currently under construction. Uh, this is just a quick overview of sort of, you know, the, the big picture of what is public funding for the arts in California look like? How does it come through? How does it get down into the communities? You know, we have a budget process. We have funding that the California Arts Council, which we are not, uh, we're the advocacy organization. Uh, the California Arts Council is your state agency that gives out the grants. You know, they're getting funding from the NEA. They're getting funding um, from the California budget. And then that goes often also out into grants and state local partners, which are some of our arts councils all around the state. Um, it gives you an idea on the right column here where we are. I think most people are familiar that overall the annual funding from the general fund uh, California budget to the California Arts Council is around $26 million a year. You can see some of the other monies that are happening around the state and how that's coming through in terms of foundation support and individual support is obviously much, much higher. Um, and then BIPOC-centered, Black, Indigenous, People of Color-centered organizations are 18% of California arts nonprofits, representing 30% of CAC funding. This is from 2021-2022 um, uh, reports, and 11% of foundation funding. 9% of California arts organizations are in rural areas, which represents 11% of CAC grant funds and 3.5% of foundation funding. The reason why we wanted to share this with you is to just talk about why it's why it's so critical that there's public funding for the arts, right? Because public funding gets into communities that private foundations and in individuals are not accessing. And we want to ensure the equitable distribution of resources for arts and culture. Next slide. Again, many of you who are on this call are familiar with this process, but I'll just do a quick overview here, just you know where we are right now. You can see the highlight of April. And as Tracy mentioned, this is really positioned advocacy day that, um, and advocacy month and all of the activities around arts, culture, and creativity month in order to try to influence what's happening in what we call the May revise, which is when the governor comes out with the next round of the budget. There's a back and forth process that happens between the legislature and the administration in terms of determining what is the final budget look like. Um, your final budget has to go to the governor for or his approval or um, you know response by June 15th. Otherwise, your legislators don't get paid. So sometimes they send sort of a, almost like a dummy budget. It's not really ready, but they send something up. Um, and uh, eventually you see what we call trailer bills. That's sometimes additions. 
final things. That's maybe where you see some of the um, uh, district asks of specific dollars to a specific district might come in the later bills. So this gives you an overview of the whole um, California budget timeline. I'll go next slide. So um, this gives you some of the data on California's creative economy. This is the specific data that in, it's both from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis and the Otis report. The new data, Tracy Wright, is not. This is not yet in in this slide. I don't think for just came out yesterday. So I'm not sure we got we were able to slide that in from BEA. I actually uh, meant to delete this slide. It's in the next slide. Okay, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> Uh, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> okay, so here we go. This is just released data. Um, uh, so thank you, Tracy, for updating this. In terms of this is 2022 data that just came out um, yesterday from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, which shows the $290 billion in economic output, 8% of California's economy, um, oh, you know, uh, close to 850,000 um, jobs and and so on. And then when you get into the Otis report, which is, you know, the full of the creative economy, you're talking about almost 2 million direct jobs and 7.6% of the California workforce. So, you know, significant uh, impact we, we make in California. And then the column on the right is showing you, but where do we stand in terms of public funding? And not, not the one-time funding, sustained public funding for arts and culture. And what you're seeing there is that we're really not ranking too well uh, still. You know, we're 36th in national ranking compared to other states like New York and Minnesota, Mississippi and Florida. Some of you've heard me talk about Florida um, and where we stand in relationship to that. So we have a long way to go uh, to really ensure that we are um, receiving the amount of public funding that matches the economic, and social, and emotional, and all the different app impacts that we make, we have a long way to go to get to where we need to. And that's part of our advocacy work. This is one of the primary things that we focus on is ensuring that there is increased public funding. Uh, because any of you who have ever applied know how competitive it is. They're only able to fund about, I think, 48% of grants in this last cycle. So, you know, we see that that uh, we need, we really need to increase this. Next slide. Um, and then, uh, you know, Martha Dempson, um, who's on our team, but also runs TIPSCA, uh, folks from Arts Fair LA, Actors Equity, um, hired and uh, and uh, California for the Arts hired Civil Economics, who for many years did the Otis Report, to really do a study specific to the performing arts. And this is just some good data points that if you are in the performing arts, we certainly recommend you download the report. Um, and it's, you know, in 2021, so we don't, it's, it's a little bit older, but now years go by quickly, don't they? But, you know, and what's an important data point that we've used that really gets particularly legislators paying attention or people who are in uh, thinking about workforce and thinking about jobs and stimulating economy and stimulating community is that for every 100 performing arts jobs in 2021, an additional 156 jobs were supported in other sectors through downstream impacts. I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about. We're talking about the restaurants. We're talking about hotel employees. We're talking about the dry cleaners who clean the costumes for the performing arts uh, events, you know, all of those sorts of things. So really, uh, you know, if you're going to find one data point right now from that slide, I think that's a good one in terms of advocating for the impact and importance of uh, ensuring that these the, the uh, performing arts remains vital and able to uh, thrive in, in our state. Next slide. So um, our own organization, uh, you know, we were trying to do our own research um, and thank you to everyone who um, who responded to our survey. These were, there was over a thousand individuals, over 600 organizations are really, actually, I think that's a great, great number. So congratulations to our team, Tracy and Jenica in particular, who really worked on the survey. You can see that um, individuals and organizations, the number one thing that they said that they're suffering from in terms of challenge is insufficient public funding. We saw the slides a couple of slides ago. We understand why, right? We just don't have the investment being made here in California um, at the state level in particular and in local and uh, communities as well. Um, for individuals, it was interesting uh, that they're saying the challenges in engaging are increasing patrons, collectors, or customers, right? So I think, you know, if you're an individual creative artist, 
maybe you're having a hard time getting them to purchase your goods. Um, on the organizational side, rising the costs due to inflation um, have just increased. Uh, we know this from putting on our own summit uh, year over year, how much things have increased. And so we have to then increase the ticket price and so on. So really, you know, what what does this mean into in terms of accessibility and um, and, and to our for our sector? One of the things that we also see consistently uh, is lack of access to affordable housing for individuals and uh, for organizations, uh, existing grant opportunities not applicable to what we need or do. So that's really an important thing for like the CAC to hear or for others to really unpack what does that mean in terms of you're putting out grants and people are like, I don't see myself in that. I'm not going to apply. What does that mean? Um, and how can we how can we look at that differently? And then lack of support systems for the self-employed, unemployment, health care, you know, sort of wraparound services, child care. These are often things that are um, consistent with other workforces that we're seeing for our the creative workforce. And then again, on the organizational side, increasing um, engagement for uh, their, their customer base. Next slide. So the top four policy priorities that we've seen then coming out of our survey is really no big surprise, but increasing funding to artists and cultural organizations through the CAC as one mechanism. Then diversify and increase sources of state funding for the arts through cross-sector initiatives. So that might be like, we're going to talk about an arts and parks initiative or funding that's going through the Office of Small Business, or maybe there's public health funding or there's workforce development or there's um, keeping you know kids engaged and, not, uh, and preventing them for, from doing drugs. Those are ways that we're also seeing or you know, stress, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and using vets, vets and the arts. These are other ways that we can increase funding for the arts that are not traditionally through our state arts agency. Number three in the top four uh, policy priorities that came out of our survey is increase access to affordable housing and or workspaces. Again, massive thing that we're hearing across the state or consistently in every community, rural, suburban, urban. And, and then these so, social safety net programs for the self-employed, you know, do we look at in joining others in fights for universal health care, as an example, because this is something that without that, we don't have a safety net if somebody gets sick and the primary way that they do their work, it doesn't allow them to have, um, you know, access to good health care. So these are some of the things we want to um, lift up in the work that we're doing. Uh, next slide. Um, so let me give you an overview of just sort of where we are this year. You know, for those of you who've been following along uh, over the, this is our sixth annual Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month. Obviously, you know, we, we've gone through a lot of different cycles in that, in these six years, um, obviously, in, including uh, a lot of influx of funding from federal funds in particular due to COVID, right? So we had a lot of massive like ARPA, American Rescue Plan and other things that brought in a lot of money into states and local communities that many of you uh, were able to advocate for on a local level and we were able to access on the state level to ensure that there was increased at least one-time funding for arts and culture. But now what we're looking at is a potential deficit of anywhere between $73 billion, $30 $35 billion. The numbers are constantly changing based on tax rolls, right? So, um, but what we know right now in terms of what the governor's budget was introduced, some of the things that the Senate has put forward in terms of their shrink the shortfall Senate priorities, there's some negotiation already happening between the assembly and the Senate and the governor around, you know, making sure that we still have rainy day funds, that we're able to shrink what they call the shortfall in terms of balancing the budget. Um, there were 2,100 bills introduced this year. That's about down 500 from the prior year. Those of you who might be coming in from other states, that sounds like a lot. Uh, it is a lot. It's a lot for us as a small advocacy organization to try and track and see which ones are impacting uh, uh, negatively or positively our, uh, the people that we're working for and with um, in terms of the creative workforce. Uh, there has been absolute mandate on no new spending. Um, we're we're also likely not even potentially seeing you know district asks and things like that. And then leadership changes. We have uh, new leaders in both um, houses, so both the assembly, which is Assembly Member Robert Revis, and now um, at, in the Senate, the new pro tem is Mike McGuire. So any of those names are familiar to you. You have relationships with those folks. Those are people now in um, uh, leadership positions. 
So, you know, our strategy thinking about this for 24-25, we'll update the slide, um, is in terms of budget advocacy is making sure that, for example, if the May revise comes out and there's some things that they are going to start talking about any budget cuts for state agencies, that this CAC, the one that we're, you know, always looking out for, in addition to all the other ones that we're trying to increase funding specifically to arts and culture, does not get a cut, right? Right now it's protected. We want to make sure it does not get cut because honestly, we're we're pre-cut levels, right? We should be way higher than 26 million. And then we also need at the same time, out of the same corner of our mouth, say why we need to also in increase that investment, even in down years. Now, even though we don't have a legislator making an increased budget ask this year, it was near impossible to make that happen this year. And we certainly, you know, the governor has not introduced any increases because they're desperately trying to balance the budget. We also know that the impact of what we're doing can solve a lot of civic issues, right? Can solve a lot of problems and can lead to really good jobs. So we want to make sure that we are talking about how important this is to continue to invest and to increase the investment. We'll talk a little bit about the related bills that we're keeping an eye on. And then, you know, around messaging, and there's more about this too, you know, we are, what we like to phrase it as, as an underutilized uh, workforce. We're going to go move away from this idea that we're undervalued, even though we know we are. It's just that it makes us seem like, you know, we're just there to say we need money. When really what we're saying is we're part of the solution. We are here to aid in solving problems, right? And, and we know that this workforce that has been long looked at as maybe non-essential should now be seen as essential because artwork is real work and put to work so that we can really have our healthier communities. And then really, I think the key is, because we're going to look at this in a second, is that we've had a lot of one-time investments, but let's not throw those out. Let's sustain them. These are good investments. And in the category of this overall um, amount of money that California, um, you know, uses in a budget, a $60 million investment, for example, in the creative core, which we'll talk about shortly, is a really smart and good investment. So we want to make sure that these things sustain and not go one time um, and, and continue. So we've we used this last year, we're going to use it again, protect cultural funding, invest in creative workers, build our creative future. Next slide. <clears throat> So I'm um, just going to now go into sort of specifics around some of our policy priorities this year. Go to the next slide. So um, this is just gives you an overall framework uh, of what we, you know, generally, this is our baseline, sort of what we're always looking for in terms of um, what we uh in our public in our policy committee here at California Arts Advocates, which is made up of board members and staff um, and our our lobbyists, we have fabulous lobbyists. I should mention Jason Smelcher. Smelcher, <laughs> I always have a hard time saying that for some reason. And uh, Priscilla Kiros from um, our lobbying firm in Sacramento, who guide us and, and support us in this work. But this gives you an idea overall: equity, investment, sustainability. I'm not going to read through each one of these, but this gives you an idea of sort of how we frame the work that we're doing on an annual basis as we're thinking about the future and what we want to in in, in, in terms of um, building out uh, public policies, what we're always looking for. Next slide. But I wanted to get, oh, just this is a, a quick overview to give you an idea of the idea uh, around um, what we've been able to accomplish together over these last several years. Um, you know, we had over $300 million in relief grant funding. We had the 60 million for Creative Core, 40 million for Creative Youth Development. We had in the end, 10 million for cultural districts. We had 25 million for arts in the parks. We saw the historic Prop 28 passage. Um, we, you know, our, our colleagues here on the call, Abe Flores and others from um, uh, um, Create California taking that lead, which is gonna be up to, you know, approximately a billion dollars to arts education annually, massive, massive. These are huge, huge accomplishments that everyone here who's been engaged in arts advocacy over the last several years should really take credit for. Um, and, uh, and, and then in this last year, when things started to shift in terms of the California budget, we were still able to both keep the funding at uh, 26 million for the CAC, introduce an idea for a creative economy strategic plan and working group for a million dollars and see SB 1116 implementation with funding for $11.5 million, thanks to incredible grassroots advocates, Actors' Equity, our organization, and then the leadership of Senator Portantino. 
as well as the administration. Next slide. Um, so here are our policy priorities for this year. Now you're going to see that this year we're not introducing a budget ask. Uh, we can't introduce budget ask. I should say we didn't get a legislator to introduce a budget ask um, because of the climate. You know, you have to read the room. You have to be, um, you know, you have to make sure that you're uh, doing this in a way that you don't get laughed out of the room in many ways. And so, you know, that's an important long game, right? It doesn't mean we don't put pressure, but it's a long game, as we all know, marathon, not a sprint. Um, we also are not introducing or, again, I shouldn't say that word, we're not sponsoring any legislation this year, uh, although likely we will start supporting um, or asking for amendments to certain key pieces of legislation that we're starting to see. Um, but we will be socializing the increase to the CAC, seeing the funding for uh, equitable payroll fund um, implemented. We want to talk about, you know, in sustained investments, as we talked about in those three programs. We also were uh, should have uh, been aside from uh, the increases in all the budget and stuff last in these last several years, um, or the one time funding and all this sort of stuff. We were really excited last year when the governor signed a bill that um, Assembly Member Tasha Borner introduced AB 812, um, and we have a fabulous um, artist housing workspace um, working group that has been assembled now through our organization that is working on toolkits and implementation for that. Um, and so these are some of the things that, you know, you'll see us continue to talk about. I'm going to get into a little bit more um, depth on some of these, but ones I probably won't get into talking too much about yet this year or this this today is around um, arts and prescription. We are actively working to build a policy brief on how we could introduce that here in California. Um, so we're putting an investment of our own into that work. Um, and then we're also looking at how do we do a pilot around guaranteed basic income for artists at, again, at the state level, that's that's really our lane. So uh, I'll go to the next slide. Um, why are we, you know, how do we socialize this conversation around needing more funding for um, the uh, CAC, our state, state arts agency? Um, you know, this gives you this graph. Again, those of you who've been with us for several years have seen this graph because sadly, except for those one time, it hasn't really changed. It has not changed. The baseline funding, which is your local assistance grants, which is why you see, you know, the council and the staff trying to figure out how to distribute such a small amount of money has not changed in six years. Uh, so it's time. Um, and even though we've had, you know, these significant one times, you can see these, you know, arrows going up. If you look, if you look at the left side there in 2003, we were actually at 30.7 million in local assistance grants. So if anything, that's what we say we're in pre-cut, right? Like we've already gone down and this is not adjusting for inflation, right? So everybody's expenses have gone up, all the costs to do business, all the costs to um, have uh, staff and workers and to hire artists has gone up and we should be paying people a thriving wage is now, uh, you know, we're not even anywhere near adjusting for inflation. So it's no, it's no wonder why we're seeing these, you know, these pain points throughout our sector in terms of having to make difficult decisions on what you can and cannot present in your community because we simply just don't have the funding to do this work. And um, and yet it is so vital. I don't certainly have to say that to anyone here on this call. So, you know, what we want to socialize is getting to that dollar, at least a dollar per person for the arts, which would get us to 40 million in baseline funding. Uh, so you'll see that in our talking points. You'll see this in our materials that you'll bring to your uh, legislative visits, because even though we may not want that can't don't feel it's, you know, the right time to ask for it this year, necessarily, we need to make sure that that seed is planted. And that as soon as things either change or we can find other ways, or we determine that all of us collectively say, no matter what, even with a deficit, this is so critical because we cannot lose our creative edge here in California. We need to fight for this together. So these are some of the things that, um, these are some of the evidence that show, you know, what's going on. Next slide. Oh, what, actually, before you go, oops, sorry. One thing I just wanted to point out on that slide that I think is an important data point too, you know, there was, when I mentioned district asks, these are the things where you can say to your legislator, I need money for a capital uh, project, um, really, you know, uh, you know, to, to redo a building or to increase whatever it is, right, specific things. And so um, legislators often have what they're able to give specifically back to their community. You see them with the big checks, right? Those are the district asks. 
Last year in the budget, there was $88 million to 43 organizations, arts and culture organizations for capital projects. Now, these are not um, grants. These are not uh, adjudicated grants. This does, might be distributed through the CAC, but it doesn't go through a grants process. So even though this is a common thing, earmarks, you call that at the federal level, this is very common in politics. One of the, and all money to the arts is good money for the arts. We're, we're never going to tell you we don't uh, support you getting money um, through your legislator. At the same time, it also indicates that there is money for the arts, right? There's $88 million last year. So it's really important that we use those data points to say it's not for the lack of money. It's just how we're de deciding to distribute it. You can make the determination if you feel that that's equitable or not. And, um, and, you know, as an organization that fights for equitable distribution of resources, um, you know, if, if one person can ask for that of their legislature, then we also want to make sure that every organization is equipped to know how to do that as well. So if you're not a, a familiar with district asks, um, even though we'd rather see, to be honest with you, more funding go to our state arts agency in an equitable grant making process, um, you know, this is something or capital project uh, funding like the museum fund had been for years. These are the sorts of things that we can fight together for. Okay, next slide. And I mean it this time. So just quickly, um, and I somebody can give me a time check. I, I get into this and I start to lose sense of where I am. But um, this was the, the bill that uh, is really addressing the impact of the increased expense due to changes in employment law for performing arts organizations to be able to pay artists and performers and everybody associated with a performing arts organization as employees. We've identified, uh, and I say we, this is a big group of folks that have really worked incredibly hard to make this happen. And thankfully the bill not only passed, but it got funded. Right now that funding is uh, being, uh, it will be allocated to the California Office of Small Business Advocate. We have excellent relationships there. We are working closely with them to talk about how to get that out, how to do build that program. And so we ask you to please stay tuned for that. One of the things, of course, we want to ensure is that not only is the funding that Senator Portantino and advocates fought hard to get in last year still maintains and is still safe in the budget, but also that we see this not just as a one time, but this again, sustained investment. These one time things are not going to move the needle. This is not going to change uh, our, our sector to be sustainable. We need sustained funding. Next slide. Um, and then I'm just going to quickly go through these because I think most folks on the call are, are familiar, for example, what, with what is a cultural district. And now there's a linkage now with cultural districts to ABA 12, um, which is, um, you know, the, the temper, up to 10 percent of affordable housing in city, county and state cultural districts to be reserved for artists, which is a huge victory in terms of establishing that from a messaging standpoint implementing that and seeing that through and seeing what other regulations and things that we need to do is a lot of what we're doing at the artist housing working group but you know right now there's 14 cultural districts that were state designated through the CAC um, that funding at one point was 30 million introduced by the governor when things started to look a little tighter in the budget, it got shrunk to 10 million. And uh, so that, that 10 million has been distributed. So right now the cultural districts program is somewhat dormant in terms of new, there is no new funding. There is some funding at the CAC that was allocated from that 10 million to be able to um, open up for new districts, but they wouldn't then have funding. They would just be able to apply and 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 create the designation. So uh, we're tracking that with the California Arts Council, with our state arts agency, to see you know when that will be reintroduced. But at the end of the day, again, this is an un what we call an unfunded mandate. This was a legislative mandate. They asked us. To, they asked the CAC to create a cultural districts program. Your state arts agency. And we fought for years to get funding, and now we're back to no funding. So, you know, this is the sort of thing where we can't build without, we can't build our creative future without investment. Next slide. 
Next slide is um, the California Creative Corps. This is a program that I, I mean, my, this is my personal belief. I think this is a really great program for the state of California. I think it's a very important uh, jobs program. I think it really highlights how artists and cultural bearers and arts organizations can be utilized in service to civic issues for public good. I think it allows artists to get thriving wages um, you know, all of these things that we all have been fighting for um, and really showing how artwork is real work. I think the Creative Corps is an excellent example of this. We've seen some incredible interim um, midstream numbers coming out of counties like Kern County, where you just haven't had this level of investment in the arts and how many jobs were created. So you'll see us starting to lift some of this up during April and beyond as we're, again, trying to educate the legislature. You can imagine, okay, Thousands of bills are passed, right? Many, if you read a budget, it's hundreds and hundreds of pages long. Who's really tracking that there was a $60 million investment in our, um, perfect, thank you, Tracy, in our, uh, in our, that there was $60 million investment in our state arts agency for the Creative Corps? Who's really tracking that? in terms of the legislature, especially as there's turnover in the legislature, it's up to us as advocates to educate them, right? This has been an important and critical program. This is what is done in your district and this is why it needs sustained funding. And this is why it checks the box for all these things that you should be caring about that it's happening in and to your community that this underutilized ver workforce can be, you know, can help and benefit. So, so this is why we're putting all of this out there for you because we want you to 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 help us, help all of us. We're all in this together to be able to lift up these issues. Uh, next slide. Creative Youth Development uh, was also one-time funding, forty million dollars that was. Um, distributed through the California Arts Council. These were the program goals as outlined by uh, the CAC when this came out. Um, there is an amazing group of folks, both in California and nationwide, that are in at the forefront of creative youth development, which is really a holistic, community-based, outside-of-school mentorship level program to utilizing culture and creativity as a way to really engage our youth, right? And so uh, this has been, um, many of you I'm sure are on this call of maybe access funding from the CAC for uh, creative youth development, for, for youth programs. Um, right now, again, where we're at is that they have $26 million to distribute for every program that they need to do at the California Arts Council. So right now, in essence, creative youth development, the state of California is not funded, again. If this is important to you, this is what you need to talk to your legislator about. Next slide. Um, I am gonna take a pause, have a sip of my spin drift and hand it to our um, colleague, Abe Flores from Create California. And he's gonna go over arts education specific uh, policy priorities for the year that we are supporting. Thanks, Julie. <clears throat> Um, as you all know, Prop 28 is definitely top of mind, um, and we're working on a couple of talking points uh, to raise awareness of some of the implementation challenges of Prop 28. They're not reflected in this document, but we're working on them. We'll, we'll give them to you. But just so you all know, one of our biggest concerns around Prop 28 implementation is um, that it doesn't do anything new, that the funds are used to replace existing funding and that arts education is not expanded in school districts as intended by the prop, as intended by um, the voters who passed it. So we really want to raise this issue with legislators of the importance of, ex of, the, of using these funds to expand. We mean more arts, uh, you, looking at the plain language of the law. Um, and so that's, that's our Prop 28 ask. We also have a couple of things that we want to uh, bring up to legislators. One is the need for more uh, arts educators in the teacher workforce. Uh, and we're asking the CDE, the legislator doesn't doesn't have authority over this, but uh, we want to raise it specifically to the Ed Committee folks so when they're talking to the CDE, is designated, designating uh, visual and performing arts teachers as a shortage area. Once it's designated a shortage area, teaching candidates have access to particular grants, 
uh, particular programs such as residency programs that are currently uh, VAPA teachers are uh, ca teaching candidates are not uh, don't have access to. And the other thing around Prop 28 is around data. Uh, currently, we do not have uh, good ongoing data on what programs are uh, available at elementary schools. Uh, schools are school districts are not required to collect elementary data. And so we have a challenge of how how do we measure the impact of Prop 28 if, if that data is not being collected ongoing. There is a reporting requirement for Prop 28 that requires the reporting of Prop 28 funds, but we don't have we're not going to have data for all arts education programming. So that's going to that makes it challenging for us to have an understanding of the impact. Um, and then just quickly on these particular bills. So that's Prop 28. Um, the the on these particular bills, one is uh, a bill that would put a bond measure for um, uh, education facilities uh, in the fall ballot. Uh, we are advocating to add and include arts education facilities in that legislation. As many as you know, if it's not named, then folks are going to be like, I'm not sure if we could use it, then we have to advocate. Like we're not asking for a carve out. We just want to make sure that folks know that arts ed facilities are important, especially with Prop 28 funding coming online. And that money can only be used for staff, materials, and con and um, nonprofit uh, arts organizations. We need facility monies. We need to ensure that our students are not learning dance on black tops and have adequate facilities. And so our ask here is we're supporting this bill, but we wanna make sure that, that uh, arts education facilities are named. The other bill is adding media arts to ed code. Right now, ed code um, um, <clears throat> uh, requires uh, school districts to offer visual and performing arts, which is currently defined as dance, music, theater, and visual arts. We want to make sure that media arts is added uh, in ed code. And lastly is uh, data. We, we want better data on teacher retention, teacher preparation programs, and that will allow us to track what are the available credential programs for VAPA teachers, identify any gaps, advocate for, for new, pro, uh, for new uh, preparation programs. So that is our data ask. Um, that's my quick in, quick in, uh, quick summary, Julie, back to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Abe. So nice to see you. Great nice work you. at Create California. And uh, they'll be joining us, of course, at the summit this year, doing a, um, a workshop on Prop 28 and, and advocacy, as well as uh, be joining us at Advocacy Day. So we're excited to have you guys with us. Uh, next slide. I think I'm almost there. So I don't have a comprehensive list of the bills that we are currently tracking, and I apologize for that. Um, but, you know, it's there are, a, I think, something like 30 plus AI bills. There are several ticketing bills. One was just introduced yesterday, I think it was, or two days ago by Buffy Wicks that um, we definitely are flagging and, and see some concerns. What we look for in these is really, you know, what is the impact for the individual arts worker and in particular also for nonprofits. And I'll say that because um, it's not to say that we aren't looking at the for-profit, but there are other organ other lobbyists who often, I think there was someone from the Recording Academy here, for example, you know, like who are looking at it from, or from Neva, from independent venues. So often we'll be the voice in the mix that will talk about, are you considering how it might be different for a nonprofit in terms of ticketing um, or are, is the artist's voice even being heard in these kind of conversations? After all, they are the worker in these cases, right? So um, I just wanted, there are a number of those. We'll be, um, I have a meeting tomorrow actually with our lobbyists that we're going to be going over uh, the ones that we are tracking out of the 2,100 bills uh, that have been introduced this year. Um, there is a, a public um, art bill that has been introduced by Kevin McCarty from Sacramento, which is a 1% for art and public capital projects. Um, but it's it's not so much, it's like more of a, like a uh, creating the systems for that, not a, a, um, and, and building towards that. We've also been hearing from our friends at the California Public Art Association, CAPA around, uh, and we've heard this through some Clean California initiatives too, 
There's been some issues with artist classifications with the Department of Industrial Relations, asking artists to register as like painting contractors, not understanding really the unique difference of what is a, a muralist, for example, or something like that. So, so we're aware of that. We're looking at, you know, what, uh, what that might look like in terms of um, advocacy and then, you know, some, some shifts in regulations. I don't have uh, anything yet uh, terribly prescriptive to share with you today. Because also, as I mentioned earlier, you know, social safety net bills, you know, there's a, a Ash Cholera, um, San Jose area has introduced AB 2200, which is a California guaranteed health care for all. Um, we know how critical health care is. Um, and then uh, Laura Friedman has introduced a California guaranteed income study and funding act. We want to ensure that artists are included in these conversations again. So that's, you know, this is where, where we, this is our purview. This is what we think about. And then, as I mentioned before, there are two things that we're looking at in terms of implementation this year, AB 812, and then the California Creative Economy Strategic Plan. There's also a couple of committees that we always keep eyes on. Some are new. One of them is from Assemblymember Matt Haney out of San Francisco, who has a downtown recovery committee that he is chairing. And obviously, we know how critical arts are to downtown recoveries. We want to ensure that maybe with these empty buildings or, you know, what is it that we can, in, in terms of regulations, po public policies, et cetera, to ensure that um, arts artists, arts organizations, cultural organizations, cultural bearers can, can occupy these spaces in a way that we can thrive and um, sustain, not to fill them in the interim uh, and then get kicked out, but actually be sustained there. Uh, also, it's interesting, uh, the former speaker, Anthony Rendon, um, has to, maybe you've seen some press on this, has created a happiness committee. Um, obviously, we're all going to say that the arts absolutely can lead to joy, right? Uh, I think I've, uh, we've all experienced it. So we want to ensure that if they're talking about happiness, arts are at the table. He's a longtime supporter. And then Joint Committee on the Arts and the Assembly Arts Committee are always ones that we're keeping an eye on um, and uh, certainly uh, prioritizing in terms of who we'll meet with on Advocacy Day. Uh, next slide. I think I'm almost done. Um, ABA 12 is the bill I mentioned, the housing policy. So, you know, implementation strategies are local. This is sort of, you know, often what happens at the state level, just like Prop 28 and things like that where it becomes a local issue on, on in terms of implementation. We wanna give you the tools to be able to advocate for this in your community. And uh, we have this amazing, and I think some of them are on the call today. If you're on the call, raise your hand, who are in our artist housing working group. We've had the pleasure to just convene uh, and really um, are, are trying to, you know, again, lift this up into toolkits and into uh, additional public policies to address this very, very critical issue. Um, and as you saw, one of our top policy priorities. Uh, next slide. And some of you might be on this. I have been um, appointed to the Creative Economy Strategic Plan uh, Working Group, which is at the state level. This was something we introduced as an idea. Thankfully, Assemblymember Wendy Carrillo, who was chair of budget committee last, last year, liked the idea, as well as the uh, speaker, Emeritus. I always say that word. Anyway, um, former speaker Anthony Randon. Also, um, he he was a big champion for this. And this was a million dollars in the budget to create a uh, strategic plan. So really thinking less from the hip, uh, but more from what is it the future look like for a creative worker in the state of California and how can California build public policies and resources to support that workforce? The Institute for the Future won the bid for the um, uh, assembling the wor working group and uh, building the strategic plan. And we'll keep you all apprised of what's happening there as this um, develops. But with something we were excited to see happen last year in the budget and now to be a part of as part of the task force. We have several board members on it as well. Next slide. I think I'm at the end. Oh, nope. Uh, sorry. Uh, not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, California Nonprofit Performing Arts Paymaster Program is something um, was also lobbied for by advocates, including California Arts Advocates. And this is really a mission-driven nonprofit paymaster to uh, support payroll compliance and lower insurance and unemployment coverage costs for uh, small nonprofits under $2 million. Martha Dempson on our team um, is our uh, paymaster expert. Uh, we work with Austin Creative Alliance to implement that. And um, we would love to get more folks in into the paymaster. So contact Martha with your um, needs and, and she will be happy to support. Next slide. 
And then I think this is it. Uh, just a, a quick flag on this, the Arts in California Parks. This is a current program in case you're, you know, maybe a lot of people go to the CAC. They're, they have grants reopening on March 28th, for example. But there's also Arts in the Parks, which was funded with $25 million. So we encourage you to go to that website, artsincaliforniaparks.org. Uh, make sure you get the notices from them as things open up. Um, and this is really to ensure that there are um, art installations and art performances um, and use it, you, you know, through a cultural lens for more participation in our, in our parks. Uh, so we just wanted to flag that and um, make sure everyone's aware of it. Next slide. Okay, now I'm done. All right, so uh, here we are. I think it's just now time anyone has questions, ideas, comments, uh, things that we didn't discuss that you wanna make sure that you're we're talking about as well. And maybe, I don't know if we stop the slideshow or yeah, if anyone else has, we can see you. Hi everybody. Nice to see folks. Lovely to see you. Thanks for joining. Marciella, did you wanna? Did I see your hand up or you were waving hello? <laughs> Just waving. Hi, everybody. I'm very excited to be here. Thank I'm you. a mariachi trumpet player. I have my own mariachi here in LA. And I'm having my, my last mariachis. Here in 2020, I paid $2,000 $2, out of my bucket, but... um. These people ripped me up and they didn't register the, 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 you know, their foundation. So that's why I'm here to learn from the bottom and see what I could do, you know, to, to keep helping my community in a way to impact mental health of teenagers, since my, my teenagers were impacted by the 2020 pandemic and it was very bad at home. So I could just imagine other people that don't have the, um, uh, you know, how to reach to the arts. If it, it was hard for me that they know about the arts and I was able to pass it down to my daughters. Uh, you know, I could just imagine other people. So um, I'm, I'm on it. I'm excited to be here every month and see if we could make some ne network. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us and speaking up. Really appreciate hearing from you. Anybody else have comments, questions, ideas, strategies? things I want to add to the conversation. If not, we'll probably transition, I think now into sort of more of an advocacy 101 training for those who are a little bit newer to this. If you're, if you've been doing this, some of you I see have been here for a while, been doing this, you may, you may say, oh, I'm good. I don't need to be on here, but maybe there's some questions. Uh, Kristen. Hi. And then we'll get to Jacqueline. Thank you. Sorry. I couldn't figure out how to get my virtual hand raised. <laughs> um, I just wanted to um, bring up that, uh, you know, in regards to the Prop 28 funding um, that, you know, Mono County, we're, you know, relatively small county. We have two districts here. We have the Eastern Sierra Unified School District and the Mammoth Lake School District. And our Eastern Sierra Unified School District only received about $52,000 total for the entire district that covers two high schools and four elementary schools. And um, that's just something I wanted to raise awareness to when we talk about Prop 28 funding. Um, also, you know, in terms of the California Arts Council, I know that a lot of their decision making in regards to the arts education grants that they um, brought back was in direct relation to Prop 28 funding. And in our case, it really, really um, had a negative impact on uh, what we can provide here for arts education. Thanks, Kristen, for lifting that up. And um, I think that's really important points, particularly from rural communities to hear. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, I think Jacqueline Diaz had her hand up, but maybe she decided to Check yeah, in. no, I just put it down. I saw okay. that you saw it, so I just put it down. Okay, great. Hi. Um, I guess I just wanted to expand a little bit on what I put into the into the chat, but I'm just curious if there's anybody that has, um, if there's any information or anybody thinking if there's like a work group happening for the for the prop um, funding that would sort of like address um, diversity and equity um, in terms of the programming that gets 
pulled in because that's um, as someone who provides that kind of programming for schools already, um, definitely a, a, a challenge. And um, there's definitely when if it gets to that level where it's at the school site level or um, particular administer levels, um, you know, there's there's definitely things that I have to navigate in terms of um, who will hire me or not. Um, and so I'm just curious if there's someone kind of thinking about that so that all of the fun, the funding opportunities don't, um, you know, end up really favoring specific kinds of art and kinds of artists um, that read, read, I guess, as this is, you know, this is what we think of as art, um, because it's so subjective, right? For sure. And uh, Jacqueline, I, I would certainly point you to Create California, to their Art Now communities also within um, certain uh, areas. I'm sure Abe and I see Allison is here from Friends of Sacramento Arts and others who are in this work more deeply in terms of specifically inside of the schools can um, put their, um, their contact information in the chat um, to support on that. But I think we, we absolutely hear what you're saying and have seen this, um, you know, in terms of what, who gets, who are the, who are the gatekeepers, who gets in and who doesn't. Um, and uh, that's something I think we're all interested in really fundamentally changing in terms of uh, arts and culture uh, and distribution of resources. So um, thank you for lifting that up. Um, Judy. Oh, um, thank you. Sorry. I was in my, I was in the chat, reviewing the chats. Um, thank you. My name is Judy Kim and I am the owner and operator of the Gardena Cinema. It is a, a single screen standalone movie theater that was built in 1946. My family has operated it since 1976. And um, I've recently established a nonprofit organization called the Friends of Gardena Cinema because we're in transition of basically going from a for-profit um, institution to a nonprofit institution. And so um, I've been looking at the things that I can do to sort of uh, uh, promote artists in my community and um and also get funding because uh, the only way that I can transition for uh to from for profit to nonprofit is that I have to buy my dad out of his um ownership share of the of the property it's a very large property it's like you know um it's almost an acre so you know I have 30,000 square feet of um uh, parking. And then, you know, the building has a seating capacity of 800. And so there's, it's, it's a very large venue, but, um, and it's hard to fill. And, um, sometimes I'm just lucky to have 20 people in there. Um, so, but I really feel like the, the venue can be kind of, a a, a place where artists can, can, um, expose themselves and it can also be a place of community and also for the community to make memories. So um, I really feel like um, I'm just kind of here because um, I, I personally feel like these arts programs that I remember from when I was in middle school really made an impact in the decisions that I made and the value that I gave to the arts and those those programs are gone. They're, they don't they don't have those kinds of summer programs. I purposely would sign up for summer school so I could take a photography class mm -hmm. or a cake making class, you know, so I could learn how to decorate my brother's cake. Stuff like that is like it's it doesn't seem like a big deal. But when you're 12 years old, it is. So, so what I would say, Judy, thank you for sharing is that, you know, these are in terms of advocacy, these are the types of personal stories. These are the types of things that we encourage you to speak with your elected officials, show them what you do for the community, why what you do and the impact you bring is so critical. And we have certainly the data to support that. And uh, many, many studies that talk about why we need community gathering spaces, why we need culturally specific community gathering spaces, why we need youth uh, engaged in arts and culture. So much data that can support and then the personal stories. And so thank you for sharing that. And I'm going to switch it now back to Tracy for those who want to get into the advocacy specifics of learning how to be um, effective arts advocates. And so is that, am I right in the transition there, Tracy? Thank you everyone for lifted up some stuff in the chat and for bringing, um, speaking up here today. And, you know, we're always available. So please reach out to us again. Thank you.
LT, if you could fire up the slides. <clears throat> now, we have about 10 more minutes left in this meeting, but I want to remind everybody that if you are looking for um, insights, uh, strategies, uh, you know, feel like you're a beginner and you need more time, please drop in in the office hours for advocating, getting ready um, and feeling um supported and excited to advocate during April. And we will offer a more in-depth advocacy training through the years. So um, Ed, Terry recently put uh, in the chat um, Jenica's email to get the link for the office hours if you feel like you need, um, you want to go a little bit more in depth than the time we're going to have here. Next slide. So just a quick distinction between lobbying and advocacy. Lobbying is an activity that is an, intended to influence a specific piece of legislation or endorse a specific candidate. Advocacy is broader. It's uh, it's more educational. It's educating and influencing opinions and decisions. And that could be of a legislative body, like a city council. Uh, it could be the public through a public um, will build, building campaign or a, 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 an opinion piece in the newspaper, et cetera. It's, uh, advocacy can be about building relationships with your elected officials, being the point person, uh, an expert on particular issues for them in their office, providing um, uh, um, research and, and pointing things out to them, et cetera, and analysis and recommendations. And it can also be, like I said, a public information campaign and public will building. Next slide. And we talk about that in terms of grass tops and grassroots, that both are really valuable and that anyone, um, anyone really can be a grass tops lobbyist. You, you are um, a resource to your elected officials in terms of letting them know what's happening in their communities. And then successful advocacy, what we look for is have you built a positive relationship and communication channel with your legislator? Um, are, you, are you educating them, bringing them information on the value and positive impacts and stories and data on, on what you and your colleagues deliver in their communities that they represent? Or you've educated on the issues, the challenges, the policies, regulations, funding issues, things like that. And you've presented them with an action to take. Legislators want to know how to solve problems. They're um, problem solvers or they care about their communities. So giving them something to do, and that can be as simple as invite them to events or invite them to experience something that you're making happen in the community, all the way to having a recommendation or a request on a specific policy. Now, for those of you participating in advocacy this year, in April advocacy, really, we'd love to hear back when you interact with legislators and you talked about increasing funding to the CAC, if you hear anybody going, yeah, that really needs to happen, let us know because maybe that person could be the, the champion for that budget ask next year because we're going to need to identify leadership. Um, and then you've shifted their position. You can you can kind of measure this. Um, do you, do they acknowledge that they've learned something from the conversation? Are they starting to adopt the language that you've shared? Um, have their attitude shifted towards the arts? Have they promised to take action, or are they working on specific po policy? All those are are positive shifts. Next slide. And. Uh, was stating the obvious local representatives and also local leaders, um, um, folks in economic development, community foundations, philanthropists, anybody working on change, working on the, the viability and the success of your community, they're potential partners to build relationships with, as well as your state legislators and your federal representatives. And we have a, um, and staff member, staff members of local and state and, um, and a federal elected representatives are are great folks to build relationships with. They're the oh, go-to person for the legislator um, and the, the subject matter experts. And on our website, there's a link that you can uh, take and you can generally, if you live in a community, a large enough community, it goes all the way down to city council level um, representation based on the address that you enter. Um, and you can find out more there and, and their websites and contact information, et cetera. New, uh, next slide. 
And on the state level, we want to know, I wanted to flag for you the specific committees that representatives serve on that govern arts funding, whether um, it's the California Arts Council funding on these budget subcommittees, um, arts policy hearings and funding, the Joint Committee of the Arts and the Assembly Committee, arts in the parks fund and museum funding is covered by the Senate budget, com budget committee that's working on resource, the, the budget committees that are working on climate climate change and resources, which is an interesting but a whole different, you know, um, set of leaders and uh, budget appropriations, of course, and arts education uh, committees. And those are links, live links to those committee rosters. And you can find your legislator and see if they serve on one of these committees. Next slide. And then just some um, ideas on um, effective storytelling, how to make the case. One is advocates learn to speak in the language of the gatekeepers, the policymakers. We learn the language of economic uh, and impact data because they care about jobs. They care about the economic viability of their particular districts and the people who live in them. And um, we've got resources on data, the Bureau of um, Economic Analysis on the federal level. Some of your communities have undergone recently the um, American Economic Prosperity Report, um, the AEP6 conducted by Americans for the Arts. So it's you can find a local um, find out about if your local community has a report. And the Otis report, the, our, our statewide report on the creative economy, also includes regional snapshots. And these can all be really great resources. And we shared some of these are linked out. The Otis report and the BA are linked out earlier in this slide deck, and you'll receive that. And then, um, or the social, the language of social impact, the change that individuals or groups might be undergoing, or policy outcome language, return on investment, you, you this much dollars generates this much impact, or health and wellness outcomes, public safety outcomes, um, language like that. So we learn to translate. Advocates are translators that bridge between arts and culture activities and artists and organizations and, and uh, the world of policy and um, policy leaders. But even more importantly are your personal impact stories. Who is it that you serve? What are the impacts? You're the expert. You're the voice that gives them the, mo the, 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 the most um, direct knowledge of what's happening in their districts because they care about what's happening in their districts. And we often um, really recommend you frame that story and an ask as a solution. Um, you're articulating a challenge. Uh, we, we see that we see that public funding, we have this wonderful program, we can't get adequate funding, we can't help bring this program to our community. Can you please take action on um, finding helping with a funding line, things like that. So it's kind of a three part, um, some data, personal story and an ask that's framed in a way that will bring value to the district. Next. And then there's a calculation you can do um, on from, let's say you uh, have an events or a venue and you can calculate generally how much additional spending your attendees would might uh, do in the local community in terms of meals and dry cleaning and babysitting and, and things like that. The event related spending, you can use that calculation. Next slide. But more importantly, you all know um, you are the art making and culture sharing is a form of knowledge production. We know how people perceive things. We know how people shift in terms of feeling and capacity. Um, and we we know when we're creating something that gives someone the ability to take action, platforms for action. This is a great, or um, this is a great resource from Americans for the Arts. It's a tool for artists to learn how to use and measure, use, uh, uh, articulate the social impact that they're having and measure it. And uh, the the um, resources animating democracy. But I just point this out just to say that that. Um, that our stories, our personal stories, often reflect how folks move through this continuum of change, either personal change or change as a group. Next slide. And then here's an example of messaging frameworks. I'm not going to get into this just in terms of time, but these are some messages that we've 
we've constructed and have found, uh, and others as well, and have found have been really effective to policymakers in terms of uh, talking with it, artists are the state's second responders that was declared in 2022 through a Senate concurrent resolution. Really that, just that message alone, we are the state's second responders. Uh, we can help with this specific issue in your community. We need funding, resources, uh, partnerships, et cetera. Um, so uh, there's there's all the, a couple different types of framings shared in this slide that I would recommend you review to see if they fit with the story that you could tell your leaders. Next slide. And we'll just share um, former a speaker of the assembly, now called Speaker Emeritus, Anthony Rendon, giving some insights into what um, he thinks arts advocates can bring to legislators. They could play that. Thank you. Oh, thanks. The advice I would give to uh, arts advocates is the same advice I give uh, to any advocate, but with a slightly different spin. Um, it's a huge state, 40 million people. When I'm in Sacramento, I wake up every day. I'm 400 miles from my home, 400 miles from my district. The best thing you can do as an advocate is to make whatever issue you're talking about seem like a local issue to that legislator. If you go to uh, visit Blanca Pacheco, who's from Downey, and say, hi, I'm, I'm from Downey. This is what we do in your city. This is These are the kids that we have an impact on. If you come to me and say, I'm from Linwood, uh, uh, I'm, I'm from Southgate, we, re we recognize that. We recognize that sense of immediacy, that lack of abstraction, how direct it is to people living in our district. I think that's incredibly important for arts funding. I think it's incredibly important in general. Next slide, sorry. And just a reminder that we are really a member fueled movement, uh, member of, uh, support for our organizations, keep these programs free and keep us doing the year round lobbying and relationship building work to be effective. And I'm gonna um, ask that we close the slide down and open the floor for questions. It's 1.30, I know it's our time, uh, our time with you is up, but for those that wanna stay on and have questions, I'd be happy to stay on a little bit longer since um, uh, just introduced a, 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 lot of, um, a lot of things. So does anybody have a comment or question that they wanna share? I would just add, um to this uh, former speaker, what he said, another thing that he said in the interview was how important it is to actually, if you can show up in Sacramento, because these legislators are far from their homes often, right? Big state. And when they have people from their community come to their office in Sacramento, it really signals to them how important this issue is to their district. So I just if you can come to Advocacy Day on April 17th, everything that we do uh, for that day is free for you to participate in. This is part of our mission. This is part of our work. So just wanted to share that as well. Right. Anna, I see your hand up. Thank you. Yeah, hi, I'm with Artists Resisting Exploitation and we fight to future-proof the arts and unite independent artists um, across all disciplines to fight against corporate exploitation and our current focus is on big tech and generative AI. So I had a question, um, listening to Julie, it sounded like you're gonna have more information about the AI bills later. Um, is that true? And then where would we find out about that? Great, great question. And I'd love to learn more about what you are all doing too. So I'll, I'll make sure to put my, or someone um, can add my email in the chat. Um, but. Uh, yeah, we're going to start unpacking some of these a little bit more. I think Ash Kalra has one um, and start looking at them more deeply to see if there's things that we need to make sure that uh, the artist's voice is also included in, in the AI um, um, legislation that's out there. Um, and then also at our summit, I'm not sure if you can come on April 16th, we will have someone speaking to some of the things that they've been, uh, they've actually done. There was a report done on the impact of AI on the future of the creative workers in games and entertainment and specifically, and uh, that um, uh, Nicole Hendricks from Brick Foundation will be on a panel talking about 
uh, you know, sort of what they're seeing and what we're trying to lift up in terms of public policy there collectively, again, um, in looking at that. So, so the answer is follow along, um, sign up for our, our stuff. Also email me so we can connect. I'd love to learn more about your organization and then um, join us if you can. And if not, you'll see lots of recordings and lots more information. So include our, you know, get on our newsletter and all that sort of stuff. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you. Anyone else? And uh, if anyone's sitting on a question that their concern might not be relevant to others, I believe me, all questions are are great. Um, if, if you've got a question, I'm sure someone else does. So please feel free to, to speak up and share on, um, on behalf of everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Alexandra. We're really um, grateful you were able to join us today. And again, please feel free to drop in in the office hours or email to connect anytime. Um, we're really committed to growing advocacy capacity in individuals and connecting you in your communities to take action locally and statewide. And um, thank you for being here with us today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks to CA for the arts team, all your excellent work putting this together. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks, LT and Terry and Jenica. I'll sign off. Thanks, Al. Later.